Jeremy, I want to start with the trial surrounding Lady Chatterley, which is described so well in the book. You were defending Penguin. Did you go in thinking you had a chance? I went in seriously thinking we had a chance, and my fear throughout the case, however, was that it only required one member of the jury to stand out for a conviction, uh, for there have to be a retrial, and a retrial would have been a complete disaster. So uh, I was, I was uh, fairly optimistic, but not very optimistic. And what was the moment at which you think the prosecution sunk? The historic phrase of, of uh, Mervyn Griffith Jones is, is a book you would like your wife or your servant to read. Of course, it was a wonderful moment in the case because then one realised that the case turned into a them and us case. Because and the jury didn't yes, have servants. The them being uh, uh, the prosecutor and the judge, and the judge's wife, I may say, who sat on the bench next to him, against us, representing what's called the ordinary person. And yet, 20 years later, you were back in an almost parallel situation defending Howard Brenton's Romans in Britain on the stage, the National Theatre. This was a case brought privately by Mary Whitehouse. How did you fight that one? It was equally a watershed case, and it did for the theatre what Lady Chatterley did for literature. It was only just before that that this extraordinary figure called the Lord Chamberlain vetted every single play that was put on on the stage. Uh, and this person, the Lord Chamberlain, was no expert of any kind. He was just a, one of the great and the good. You defended Christine Keeler in the Profumo affair. So much has been said about her, you know, was at the time and since. What was your impression of her? I thought she was pathetic, rather. She had, to, very unlike her friend, Mandy, uh, Mandy Rice Davis, who ha had her head thoroughly screwed on, knew exactly what she was doing, was the most amusing and delightful character, but very streetwise. Uh, Christine had a terrible youth, brought up in an awful circumstance. She had an abortion when she was 16 years old, had no background at all, came to London, got into sleazy clubs, but she was extremely beautiful. And I don't think, she was only 19 and 20 and 21, you know, when all this was happening. And I don't think she understood what was going on a lot of the time. Sometimes the law doesn't seem to correspond with, with public opinion more widely. I'm thinking recently of the case of Lord Janna, who was never put on trial after accusations of child molestation because he was deemed by the DPP and the medical profession too ill to take the stand. Yeah. And yet the public had a sense of indignation about that. Do you think the law was out of step, was out of tune. There was a punitive streak in the English nature, which I've never been able to understand. We're a very punitive nature, na nation. And uh, immediately something like that arises. There seems to be an immediate current. Of, this man ought to be punished. This man ought to be punished. And if he has Alzheimer's and can't go into the witness box and speak in his own defence, it seems to be quite extraordinary that that man should, anybody should want to try him. Last question. Um, you originally wanted to join the League of Nations. I'm wondering when you consider the conversation now surrounding our EU membership, the Human Rights Act, what impact it has on you? Well, to me, it's, it's unbelievable <laughs> that any government 
could want to destroy the Human Rights Act. I, and I, I don't know if politicians have any kind of historical sense anymore, but if you'd lived through the 30s, you'd seen the European nations all at each other's throats, you, uh, building up of armaments. Uh, when Winston Churchill said it's better, jaw, jaw is better than war, war, how right he was. And uh, it's almost miraculous these countries who have now been freed from the domination in Eastern Europe, if they want to join the EU, they've got to sign up to the Human Rights Act. And sign up they do. And the Human Rights Act, largely drafted by English lawyers, uh, is, sets out in a perfectly simple way all our democratic rights. And 44 nations have signed up to that in Europe, and here is only one of them wants to get out of it, and that's the originator of the country themselves, the United Kingdom. I find it unbelievable. Jamie Hutchinson, thank you. <laughs>